request Rajesh Sina to, to inaugurate, in fact, this uh, webinar by telling us about conjunctivitis, what everyone should not miss and what everyone should know about conjunctivitis. It looks to be a very simple topic, conjunctivitis, okay, give him Isol, give him one antibiotic, give him uh, one uh, lubricant and ask him to five days. But there could be a lot of things which, uh, you know, we can't, we don't revert the lid or so many things. I think Rajesh is the best one to tell us. Rajesh, over to you, please. Uh, I will, yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, very good evening to all of you. I would like to thank at the outset, uh, Dr. Lalit Parma, sir, for giving this nice concept and conceptualizing this uh, nice webinar, which, uh, you know, we all know that ITIS is attached to so many things, so many layers, so many, uh, you know, diseases. But, uh, you know, having a webinar and webinar series on ITIS and different types of ITIS will be a rare collection. And I will request him to keep a recording of this collection because, you know, people would like to, you know, visit this. Uh, we will be having so many speakers, so many discussions, so many things that we will be, I will be learning, others will be learning. So it will be wonderful. Rajesh, uh, one second. Uh, I'm sure uh, in Milmet people are hearing this, what Rajesh said, very relevant. That uh, uh, is Manoj Mahajan or uh, or uh, Mukesh there. So uh, I would request that uh, this should be recorded and made available uh, uh, immediately after it or maybe early tomorrow. See you, sir. Okay. So uh, I would like to begin, and I mean it's an honor to start this itis series with conjunctive itis, and. Uh, but my idea was uh, that, uh, you know, in presenting this uh, conjunctivitis talk was not to give you uh, complete information about conjunctivitis because it is already there in so many uh, uh, books and so many places. So the, the idea is to, uh, to understand, to share with others that what will be my approach if I get a patient in my OPD with a clinical picture like this. Now, having conjunctival congestion and, uh, you know, which looks like conjunctivitis, of course, it's a case of conjunctivitis. But if a patient like this clinical picture comes to you in your OPD, you know, in that case, what should be your approach? And my approach in such a scenario will not to immediately make a diagnosis of conjunctivitis. I will not jump to this diagnosis. In such a scenario, we can have some other conditions also which needs to be ruled out. Very often it has been seen that, you know, such uh, uh, congestion has some in, inner inflammation, some uveitis, which has been missed because the patient was examined on torchlight uh, only. And then the patient comes after 10 days that the redness is not going and all sorts of problems he's having. So what is most important, apart from some other important things, there are two important entities which should be ruled out if you get a case of a pink eye, and that is uveitis and glaucoma. And for ruling out uveitis, you just have to examine the patient on slit line biomicroscope. You just have to see whether there are flare and cells in the anterior chamber and retrolental area, whether there are KPs, what is the condition of pupil, whether it is round, small, circular, reacting well, whether it's mid-dilated, what is the intraocular pressure? And once you have ruled out that the patient is not having uveitis, not having glaucoma, not having any other uh, uh, major uh, entity, then of course you think in the line of conjunctivitis. Now, once you have a case like this with a complaint of redness, watering, discharge, irritation, itching, foreign body sensation, lid edema, and you have ruled out uveitis and uh, 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 high intraocular pressure, then of course it is a case of conjunctivitis. Now, conjunctivitis can again be infectious, it can be non-infectious. Uh, the presentation, presenting feature may overlap, but the infectious causes can be viral or bacterial and non-infectious can be allergic. Somebody can have something dropping into the uh, conjunctiva and that can result in this conjunctival congestion. So a good history is very important to rule out any toxic, any chemical that, that has gone into the eye causing conjunctivitis. And of course, a detailed history to rule out all the other causes 
uh, needs to be done. The immune mediated and neoplastic, I will not go into it because these are uh, separate chapters, as, uh, like uh, you know OCP and SJS and OS OSSN, etc. But I'll be talking mainly about the routine causes of uh, conjunctivitis. You can have congestion in episcleritis and scleritis. In episcleritis, you can have a sectoral congestion. So that will give you an idea, the engorgement of uh, you know, episcleral vessels. In scleritis, you can again have a deep vessel engorgement. So all these things can be assessed by doing a good slit lamp biomicroscopy. And then once you are convinced that it is a conjunctivitis, then you just have to see whether it's a viral conjunctivitis or a bacterial conjunctivitis. A viral conjunctivitis mostly is caused by adenoviral, conjunct uh, adenoviral. Bacterial conjunctivitis can be caused by uh, many bacteria, but it is not as common as viral conjunctivitis. Viral conjunctivitis is the commonest cause of conjunctivitis. You all see every now and then in every OPD, and mostly it is self-limiting without causing any fibrosis, without causing any sequelae. Apart from a few cases wherein you have to be very careful, the commonest cause is adenovirus, which results in the most common cause of dry eye in the entire world. It is responsible for 92% of all keratoconjunctivitis cases and 15 to 70%, up to 70% of all conjunctivitis cases. And, uh, and apart from the, the complaint the patient will give to you regarding redness, watering, etc., on examination, you will get to see that there will be bulbar conjunctival congestion, chemosis, follicular or papillary reaction. There can be hemorrhage as well and uh, mm -hmm. follicular reaction of inferior tarsal mm -hmm. conjunctiva. There can be a little bit of crusting and swelling of lid as well in these cases. If you have a case of... Uh, viral conjunctivitis, you should be very, very careful in seeing the uh, tarsal conjunctiva. And if you get to see this uh, membrane, seromembrane, then that requires a special treatment. Sometimes you can get to see these nimular infiltrates in the cornea, and that requires special attention. So a thorough slit lamp evaluation is a must. Conjunctivitis is not a disease of torchlight. You have to examine the patient thoroughly. There can be presence of pseudomembrane, there can be presence of a true membrane. And a pseudomembrane, you can detach it easily, but in a true membrane, what happens is that there is a bacillalization. So if you try to detach it, it can bleed. And multifocal subepithelial infiltrates are very often seen in uh, uh, adenoviral conjunctivitis, particularly with serotype 8. What happens is that there are small numular coin shaped 0.5 to 1 millimeter oval to round uh, uh, infiltrates in the superficial cornea, subepithelial. And it can be present uh, discreetly somewhere, maybe in the peripheral, mid peripheral part, but sometimes it can be uh, uh, very huge in number, involving the central part of the cornea, causing reduction in visual activity. And sometimes a patient comes to you with the hemorrhage in the, uh, in the eye. He says that suddenly the eye has become red. And when you examine, there is presence of conjunctival hemorrhage. So it normally it happens because of the infection by enterovirus 70 or 71. There can be other causes of hemorrhage, uh, conjunctival hemorrhage as well. But as far as conjunctivitis is concerned, this is caused by enterovirus 70 and 71. And this is not a very serious condition. It will go off very fast, it goes off even faster than the non-hemorrhagic variant. But the only thing is there can be trace of hemorrhage left, which you have to explain to the patient, which will go off uh, over a period of week or 10 days. Preauricular lymphadenopathy is something which many ophthalmologists miss to see, and it should be seen because that is a big clue because most of the adenoviral conjunctivitis, which is the commonest cause of conjunctivitis, will have preauricular lymphadenopathy after 48 hours or 72 hours of uh, the onset of symptoms. So if you see that, then you are sure that, okay, it is a uh, noviral uh, conjunctivitis, and then you can treat accordingly. In bacterial conjunctivitis, again, you will have all these features, but there will be very thick discharge in these uh, bacterial conjunctivitis and cause more of matting of lashes and uh, you know crusting of lids. These things are more often seen with bacterial conjunctivitis. So once you get to see these cases, viral or bacterial, what you have to do, the objective of management is to understand what type of conjunctivitis is this. You have to differentiate other causes which can cause a similar picture. And then you have to uh, do appropriate therapy. 
the idea is also to relieve discomfort and pain because these pay this many times uh, some people may say that this is a viral conjunctivitis it will go off with time but the self limiting but you have to relieve the patient of discomfort chemosis and pain as well and prevent complications and most importantly you have to prevent prevent it spread to others that is very important so if it's a bacterial conjunctivitis we will give antibacterial that is as simple as that you have to give it aggressively so that you can treat it uh, the the bacterial infection but if it's a viral uh, conjunctivitis there also you give an, uh, these antimicrobials but only for 2 to 3 times a day just for a prophylaxis but in bacterial conjunctivitis you give it for therapeutic purpose so you give it more frequently and astringent drops and lubricant drops are given to reduce chemosis to provide comfort to the patient if you get a condition like this as i mentioned earlier the sub epithelial numular uh, exudates numular infiltrates and if it is involving the central part of the cornea and if it is causing reduction in visual acuity then you have to give topical steroid the reason is this that if you don't give steroid it will not get resolved and uh, then there will be if there is a permanent scarring it stays for long then it will remain permanent and then the patient will have some optimal visual acuity and there can be scattering of light through those uh, th- those thin scars as well so um, steroid is essential in these cases if you get a serum membrane like this here also you have to give topical steroid now but the point that you have to remember is that if you are giving steroid in a case of uh, you know these numular uh, infiltrates of adenoviral keratoconjunctivitis enteritis the risk of recurrence has been shown to be higher now in that scenario my approach is that i normally start cyclosporine along with steroid and gradually once the lesion resolves completely then i taper off the steroid continue the uh, person on cyclosporine on a long term basis so that although there is no definite uh, uh, evidence in literature that cyclosporine prevents the recurrence of uh, these uh, lesions in endoviral keratoconjunctivitis but cyclosporine is a known immunomodulator which can be given on a long term basis something like maybe 6 months 8 months time and it also improves the ocular surface so it is not going to harm the ocular surface it is not going to harm systemically and it can be given on long term and it is an immunomodulator which may maintain the clarity so that is the basic idea behind adding cyclosporine in these conditions as far as steroid is concerned which steroid to use uh, studies have shown that lotoprednol and dexamethasone have been found to be equally effective give if i am asked what to do i will use lotoprednol or fluoromethylone in most of the cases except a very few cases wherein if i get to see very uh, very many uh, you know sub epithelial uh, infiltrates which are you know sort of getting confluent sort of obstructing visual access quite significantly so i will give a short burst of uh, say a potent steroid like dexamethasone maybe for 4 to 5 days and then move on to the lutopredinol and and of course along with cyclosporine and then taper off the lutopredinol apart from these management we should also think about the adjunctive manage- management like the the discharges the eye should be kept clean the discharges should be cleaned off you should uh, remove the uh, discharges the crust from the lashes one should be careful when if somebody is using contact lens one should avoid using contact lens you have to prevent the spread of infection as well that is your duty and uh, uh, you should use clean towel or tissue each time you wipe your face and eyes one should wash hands every time you sneeze or cough you are you know putting your hand over your nose etc you are touching the eyes you should wash your hands and you should never do a makeup because if there is any inflammation and uh, mm-hmm. if you are doing makeup something like mascara etc then bacteria has been found to be particularly pseudomonas keratitis has been reported after use of uh, these mascaras uh, when somebody had any conjunctival or any sort of uh, ocular inflammation so that should be avoided now apart from the viral and bacterial conjunctivitis you can have some variation in presentation also which will guide you to know to understand that probably it is something else what can be that if some individual comes to you with redness which is not very intense as 
you know, viral or bacterial conjunctivitis, right? but there is sufficient uh, redness and he is having intense itching. That is the key, intense itching. And of course, watering. Then you have to elicit certain history, something from him. You have to elicit history of systemic allergy. You have to his elicit history of asthma. You have to elicit history, family history of uh, such a condition uh, in their, uh, you know, uh, sisters and brothers and parents. Then you also have to elicit history of previous episodes, especially during seasonal variation. Something, you know, related to chronicity of the condition. If that is the case, then uh, allergic conjunctivitis is something which is, uh, uh, which is, uh, you know, diagnosed in such a condition because that is what you will feel if there is intense itching and uh, and with these features. Now, if you get to see such a condition, you should definitely avert the lid. You should see whether there is papillary hyperplasia. You can have VKCs, you can have AKCs, depending upon the age of the individual, depending upon the manifestation. So uh, you can have all these... Uh, you know, uh, the uh, Horner Trantas uh, dots, the cobble stoning of papillae in uh, VKCs, you can have superficial corneal neovascularization in AKCs. Then, uh, as I said, that you know, these allergies have chronicity. Because of the chronicity, you can get these uh, 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 increased pigmentation in the interpapillary conjunctiva. And if you get to see that, then this is an allergic conjunctivitis and you have to treat them with uh, certain drugs like uh, dual acting agent. Olopatidine is something which has been used very frequently over the last decade or so. And azelastin and bivotastin have also come up and they are quite effective. Alcastidine is a newer agent which is quite potent, much more potent than olopatidine and much more effective. And uh, although I don't have uh, too much of experience of alcastidine, but I have seen in a few patients wherein they were not very comfortable with olopatidine, uh, they were shifted to, uh, to alcastidine and they were quite comfortable. So I'm, uh, that way, in a few patients, I've seen that it is quite effective. Topical steroid, topical cyclosporin, preservative-free lubricants are the ones which are also given in order to relieve the patient of allergy. And systemic medication are given only in a few patients who have a systemic allergy, history of asthma, history of uh, systemic allergy, not responding to uh, all the medical, uh, all the topical medications, then you can give systemic anti-allergics, effects of anodine or any other anti-allergics. And very rarely you have to give steroid wherein uh, you uh, systemic steroid wherein the patient is a known asthmatic and having severe allergy. Supratarsal injection of steroid is given in certain conditions of cobble stoning of, uh, uh, of uh, um, the papilla, uh, uh, papillary hyperplasia and cobble stoning appearance. And you can give 0.05 ml of, uh, 0.5 ml of uh, uh, tramcinolone in uh, these uh, conditions. 0.5 to 1 millimeter above the superior margin of uh, tarsal conjunctiva, you can give two or three injections. And most often what I have noticed is that a single uh, uh, episode, a single uh, injection is not, does not help in many of these patients who have intense cobblestoning and they require multiple injections. And then of course, the supportive treatment as well. Some of the cases may have shield ulcer like this, and this is basically because of the mechanical damage by uh, the cobblestoning of papillae. So uh, what you need to do is that you have to debride this plaque, and once you have debrided the plaque completely, then you can put amniotic membrane. Now, sometimes if the plaque is quite deep and you have debrided it deep, then you get a gutter kind of thing, then you may have to put multi-layered amniotic membrane to fill up the gutter and then put an overlay. Otherwise, there are many uh, cases wherein you can just put, uh, remove the plaque, put an amniotic membrane and it works well. And apart from that, you have to give the uh, anti-allergic medications uh, as I have mentioned earlier as well. Uh, a word about COVID conjunctivitis because this is a COVID era wherein uh, you know conjunctivitis has been reported and conjunctivitis and keratitis are ones which are reported ocular signs of COVID-19. Although there is a report of, uh, and, uh, of central retinal artery occlusion as well. Now, uh, but central retinal artery occlusion is basically because of the thromboembolism, but the effect in the cornea and conjunctiva is more because it contains ACE2 receptors and TMPRSS2. 
it is known that the covid virus the corona virus has it has an affinity to attach to ace2 receptor and tmprss2 protein and in the area where there is co expression of ace2 receptor and tmprss2 protein and that is cornea and conjunctiva so cornea and conjunctiva are prone to develop uh, inflammation because of corona virus conjunctivitis can be seen in 1 to 3% of cases with corona virus infection and it may be the first symptom of corona infection and the transconjunctival aerosol spread is the mode of uh, disease transmission and even for the doctors for ophthalmologists close contact during ophthalmic procedures carries a risk and as i said direct contact with a person having covid is a risk factor and that happened to lee win liang who contracted this virus from an asymptomatic glaucoma patient so um, uh, and and basically it is diagnosed uh, by the symptom and signs but uh, the microbiological diagnosis is done by nasopharyngeal swab or conjunctival swab now even in conditions the studies have shown that even in uh, patients who have who are covid positive and have conjunctivitis their rt pcr of nasopharyngeal swab is uh, positive in 74% of cases but in conjunctival swab it was positive only in 5% so nasopharyngeal swab still scores even in conditions wherein you have a conjunctival uh, involvement in covid it is of course a self limiting condition and you just treat it like any other uh, conjunctivitis and uh, if there are systemic involvement of covid then of course you have to give whatever antivirals and steroids etc so uh, just to give you a message in the end that you know this is a time of corona and if a patient has come to you with uh, covid with a with a conjunctivitis you have to do that triage system you have to separate the patient you have to keep him in a separate area where you, you can examine the individual not only by uh, you know wearing all the gloves and uh, the gown and the head cover etc but you should be uh, uh, protecting your eyes as well by using goggles or maybe face shield etc so that uh so that because the reason why this 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 is an editorial uh, in british journal of ophthalmology the reason why this has been advocated is the fact that the health care worker at wuhan despite being fully gowned with protective suit and n95 respirator mask he was infected by the virus with conjunctivitis as the first symptom followed by development of fever so you infection can come from uh, uh, from somebody who is just having conjunctivitis it has happened to ophthalmologist in uh, del in in india as well and so that is why it is very essential that any patient with conjunctivitis at this point of time we should take all precautions including eye protection thank you very much for your patient listening and uh, uh, i'll be willing to uh,